Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to present Julia Donati and Francine van den Brandele here at WSL. So their talk will be about a B2B2 project uh, on social ecological networks. Um, Julia has joined BGB already, already in phase one. She was already doing the ecological network a year ago. She is an ecologist. Uh, she did her PhD with Loïc at ETH a couple of years ago. Francine, we could uh, interest her in BGB. Luckily, she is a social scientist. She did her PhD in Amsterdam. And she's been part of this B2 project since last fall. And it's really a very lucky thing that we have Francine because she, from the social aspect, uh, complements very well what Julia has been doing and will be, do, um, will be doing in the ecological realm. So today we will hear about um, steps toward building social ecological networks. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. Um, I hope you can all hear me well, also online. Thank you for, for coming today. Um, I'm happy to present together with Francine this uh, BGB uh, project on social ecological network approach to enhancing blue-green biodiversity at rural urban yeah, interface. The administrative thing is dot backslash. Yeah. Backslash. OK. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'll just briefly introduce the, the project. Um, so this is a collaboration between AIWAC, WSL, and Collaboratio Helvetica. Uh, so it is led by Janine here and by Manuel Fischer at AIWAC. Um, Julia, as you've now heard, is uh, the postdoc uh, in this project, and she has a she's an ecologist, and I'm a postdoc with a social science background. Uh, and also Peter Besh from AIWAG is collaborating on this project, as well as Achilleas Somas here at WSL. And we're also lucky to have uh, several master students and research assistants who are also uh, supporting us in this uh, project. And we have uh, Collaboratio Helvetica, which is an initiative um, uh, that does dialogue uh, oriented uh, experimental and collaborative approaches to foster uh, transformational change. And they're helping us uh, because this project is also part of the implementation track of the BGB uh, initiative. And so they're going to help us, especially later this year, organizing some workshops. Okay, so to give you a bit of background of why we are doing all of this, uh, you are all well aware that biodiversity is uh, under threat, especially in human dominated landscapes, where increasing urbanization and uh, agricultural land demand increasingly degrades, reduces habitats and isolates them. And one of the vertebrate groups which are especially threatened globally by this uh, um, factors are amphibians, which are also highly diverse and um, yeah, globally declining with over 3000 species uh, recorded to decline. And they are quite an interesting model system to study blue-green biodiversity because they, they require both environments, so aquatic and terrestrial ones. And of course, uh, protected areas and ecological infrastructures have been created to try to support um, biodiversity in the best way possible but uh, they might not be sufficient in the long term. And this is where um, the natural capital components, so blue and green spaces in urban areas become increasingly interesting. And if they are planned and designed uh, in a strategic way, they can support a better cohabitation between human and nature. So briefly, uh, a definition of blue-green infrastructure, and maybe you're already very familiar with, uh, with this, uh, this term, but it refers to nature-inspired uh, engineered infrastructures. Uh, so um, interconnected networks of both natural and designed landscape elements, 
and it includes uh, blue elements, so rivers, ponds, for example, as well as green elements like urban trees, green roofs, parks, etc. And using blue-green infrastructures has become more and more popular uh, to address, uh, so for flood mitigation, climate adaptation, um, but also you see it more and more for carbon sequestration in cities, uh, improving air quality, improving water quality, um, but there's also a big social aspect to it, so improving well-being, providing areas of leisure for residents, uh, health, uh, and much more. Uh, you can, we, people can use these as alternatives to gray traditional uh, conventional infrastructure, as well as uh, together in complements with these, uh, these measures. You find them in all kinds of uh, sizes, and so some examples you see on the, the pictures, so green roofs, uh, riparian corridors, um, urban trees, parks, um, bioswales, and more. Exactly. And beyond these human centric beneficial uh, benefits, they are also increasingly interesting for biodiversity and offer uh, nice synergies. Uh, here you have an example of um, different landscape, um, different ecological corridors that come in different shapes and sizes. And some of them probably rather uh, in urban areas uh, are seen or are have the shape rather of stepping stones. And here we show an example of them. And so the idea is to, to really look at the ecological net network from a regional perspective, but also at the local perspective, trying to, uh, to take the maximum out of the urban uh, natural capital components. So using blue-green infrastructures and, and nature-based solutions more generally uh, has become more and more popular. Um, but implementation and scaling of these types of solutions remains a big challenge. And it's not just a technological challenge, uh, which it also definitely is, but it's also a governance challenge. And uh, here there's... Um, uh, a sentence based on the work of Eleanor Ostrom. Maybe you've heard of her. She is a political scientist who had the no received the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2009 for her work on the, the commons. And she argues that effective conservation almost always requires some level of cooperation or co collaboration among multiple actors to coordinate activities and avoid conflicts over resources. Um, so governance, very broadly, it's the process that shapes the decisions that actors take and how they frame different types of policies. Um, and uh, so especially in human dominated landscapes, <clears throat> there are often many different actors with different interests. Uh, and if you're trying to implement, design and implement blue-green infrastructures with multiple benefits, that also often involves a lot of different actors um, so some more focus on floods, air quality, biodiversity. And so aligning these different interests and collaborating is often a huge challenge. And so some of the challenges that can arise are below. So just examples are competing priorities, a lack of communication, uh, partnerships that are not uh, functioning, and much more. And there's still quite a lack of understanding of um, how these interactions uh, work. And so below is an example. This is from my PhD research in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So on the left is a picture uh, of this, uh, this big plan that uh, the state government had to create a, a linear park that would go from the center of the city all the way to the uh, source of the Chetje River. It would be 75 kilometers long and be the largest linear park in the world. It would be a major blue-green infrastructure that would uh, help mitigate floods, provide lots of leisure areas, uh, bike lanes and football fields, um, improve the, the quality of life of uh, people living in the area, but also support biodiversity and much more. Um, and so 12 years later, so today, uh, pretty much none of this park has been created. You see the picture on, on the right. 
And uh, what happens is that uh, there are lots of conflicts between the state and municipalities, also between municipalities. And there are also many informal settlements in the places where the park were going was meant to be constructed. And it's not so easy to just remove people like that. So um, yeah. Creating, fostering this type of collaboration uh, to successfully implement blue-green infrastructure is often a really big challenge. Yeah. And so now if we return back to Switzerland, <laughs> here is a small extract of um, some of the findings we found during the BGB1 phase project. Here you have a small extract of the, the Limat, uh, Limatal. Here is Schlieren. Zurich is somewhere here. Um, and so in, in, in the red colors, so the increasing red colors, you have the predicted movement pathways of amphibians between amphibian breeding sites. And if, if these uh, corridors overlap either with green uh, spaces, they, it, they are indicated in blue, or with um, impervious areas, then they are indicated in red. And here I would like you just to focus on the blue parts, which could be potential candidates for blue-green infrastructures in this area. And uh, as we had a deeper look into what are actually these green spaces, they are really a wide variety of spaces that range from uh, golf courses up here to urban parks to even um, it's the garden areas around the buildings or uh, cemeteries and all these green blue green spaces then relate to different actors and so in in the context of conservation biology if we want to have an efficient conservation management plan it really requires a coordinated and uh, a collaborative approach that uh, across various uh, types of, of actors. Right, so social ecological <coughs> networks uh, that you see um, a sort of example on the right of what that could potentially look like. So you have, um, yeah, so you see, uh, <laughs> this is a bit difficult. Okay, you see many different types of actors, uh, and you also see different types of blue-green infrastructures or landscape elements, uh, and you see that they're at multiple levels and interconnected with each other. So basically, this is what we're going to be looking at. We, we want to uh, ask in the research part of this project, what are emerging structures from empirically validated cross-scale and multi-level social ecological networks uh, with the idea that um, it's, a necessary, it's a necessary thing to understand, uh, to better understand these structures if we want to um, improve the ability of blue-green spaces, blue-green infrastructures to mitigate biodiversity loss. <clears throat> and then, so this project also has, is part of the implementation track of the Blue-Green Biodiversity Initiative. And so within the imp implementation component, we're going to ask what are transformation pathways towards more sustainable and persistent blue-green areas. And the two parts of this project are also interconnected. So uh, findings from the research part will feed into the implementation parts and uh, vice versa. <clears throat> and so focusing on the, the research, uh, the, so the main research question again. Um, so, so to understand the network structures, um, here we have a quote by Orion Bodin. So achieving effective, sustainable environmental governance requires a better understanding of the causes and consequences of the complex patterns of interdependencies connecting people and ecosystems within and across scales. So basically to ensure more sustainable environmental governance, it's really important to better understand who are the people involved, what are the ecosystems involved, and how are they uh, interlinked with each other. Um, and so on the, the bottom left, you see a representation of what a, a social ecological network would look like. So it's composed of a social network on 
on top and an ecological network on the bottom uh, with connections to each other. And here, so the red nodes represent social actors. The green nodes represent ecological, um, e ecological elements, infrastructures. And so social actors are connected with each other, but they're also interacting. They also act on these different ecological infrastructures. Um, so you see an example here of two different actors that both uh, act on ecological infrastructure A. And here you see two different actors that both act on separate ecological infrastructures, but these are connected uh, to each other. Uh, however, the actors are not connected with each other. So ideally, um, they should also be interacting and collaborating to uh, improve the, the governance of these ecological infrastructures. Exactly. And so now I just walk you through briefly through our work packages. So in order to create or better understand this social ecological network, we first need to focus on the ecological network, uh, then separately on the social network, and finally uh, on integrate both to create this fully articulated social ecological network. So these three uh, work packages are part of the research component of this project, whereas in parallel of this, we are running together with Collaboratio Helvetica also um, uh, we are going. We are preparing a workshop series that will uh, invite different uh, stakeholders in order to um, to do some. Uh, how do you say to develop collaborative uh, solutions uh, in relation to BGIs? And maybe I give you a bit of insight on the ecological network first. So this is based on last year's work. Uh, here we used an integrated modeling approach where we started by building um, ensemble species distribution modeling for different species uh, based on recent data sets of amphibians occurrence and several predictors uh, that relate to the whole life cycle of uh, amphibians. From these, we um, from the species distribution models, we were able to convert them into resistance maps, which are used as inputs in circuit theory models, uh, like circuitscape here. And they allow them to, um, to better understand the, the movement pathways of, in this case, amphibians in a landscape. And below here in red, uh, basically we have our ecological corridor, uh, ecological network, sorry, where as nodes, uh, so far, we used amphibian breeding sites, and then um, the links would be all the corridors that are in red. And beyond this, uh, we identified potential new nodes, as you saw before, uh, these stepping stone, uh, mostly in the urban uh, settlements. Um, and these could be additional nodes in our uh, ecological network. Here, I just want to show you concretely what, what does it look like. So we started from a, a regional uh, modeling approach because we want to enhance regional um, ecological networks. And then we looked into um, urban settlement areas. And here I have highlighted in red and blue these potential candidates for BGIs. And if we look at what they look like, well, here, uh, this is the city of Döttingen in the north of Argau. There is a small uh, channel, a stream, which is walled. So it's an already existing green space, but probably it can be further enhanced um, to better support biodiversity. And another example of these potential candidate, rather from gray transformations, are, uh, is this um, gravel pit area, which is also an important uh, habitat for certain species. It's right adjacent to the, to the river. So here, uh, uh, some transformation or an adapted management plan could be also beneficial. And then we always need to consider the broader uh, 
the broader landscape and here in orange are highlighted uh, ecological corridors that we identified, especially for these species. As you can see, they are in the middle between the green patches, which are the forest, and the yellow one, which are the arable lands. And so forest edges appear to be important uh, links in this network that need to be preserved or further enhanced. And this requires then a, a, co a coordinated management between forestry and agriculture, for example. So as part of the BGB2 project now, where will we construct these social ecological networks? We selected 12 case study areas that you see here with different colors. They range from uh, areas that are rather rural with a high overlap of ecological infrastructure, for example, in the Reustal, then uh, up to really highly urbanized areas like in Zurich or Winterthur. Um, so where the, the, the level of human impact or the of urbanization increases. And then we also look at where there are opportunities for uh, BGIs in these spaces. And what is especially interesting is, or I like are these orange patches, which are rather uh, peri-urban areas. And these are really places where intervention is needed now. In, if we think about urban sprawl and these are probably the areas where um, the further planning or implementation of BGI will be more beneficial. And of course, not of least important, we se importance we selected these, uh, have these um, case studies also according to whether they are important hotspots for biodiversity in terms of suitable habitats, so rather resource habitat, or if they are important for uh, movement, so for connecting different uh, breeding sites. And so what we always look at, so we look at this uh, the ecological network, but always in relation to uh, really fine scale information on the landscapes through the cadastral maps, uh, where beyond saying it's a urban green space, we can really say it's a cemetery or it's a urban park. And really, uh, this is very valuable data, which allows to then physically identify uh, interesting locations. Okay, so then <clears throat> I will say a little bit about work package two, which is about the social networks of blue green areas. And first of all, um, we focus on the actors, so selecting the relevant actors for the network, and we developed uh, different criteria for that. <clears throat> uh, so first of all, we selected actors that had to be active in the case study areas that, uh, that Julia had mentioned, so different case study areas in uh, Kenton, the Kentons of Zurich and Argau. They have to have a, either a direct link to biodiversity <clears throat> or a direct link to blue-green spaces. And this led us to over 20 uh, actor uh, categories. So below are just uh, some representations of potential actors, so governmental actors, research actors, uh, actors from forestry, from agriculture, from real estate, um, leisure, transportation, etc. cetera. Um, so we classified them in terms of different sectors. Uh, in terms of type, which is whether it's a governmental actor, a non-governmental actor, a uh, private actor, and uh, in terms of level, so from the, the local level all the way to the global level, <clears throat> although the global is maybe not that relevant in our case, but yeah, so understanding uh, actors across levels. <clears throat> um, And so this is just more of a representation of uh, what the social network would look like. So different actors uh, are connected to each other. And what you see is that some actors, so the ones that have the gray circles around them are more connected than other actors. So uh, that's a little bit some of the patterns that we're trying to see. We're trying to understand who are the really central actors in the network, what, which are the ones that have the most influence uh, and act also as sort of bridging organizations between uh, other parts of the, the social network. 
Uh, and so to build the social network, we're in the process, uh, almost finished, with uh, creating a survey that will go out to thousands of people in both cantons. <clears throat> And uh, so these are just some examples. It's maybe a lot of information, but some examples of uh, what we're going to be asking them. So uh, in terms of their interaction, the interactions of respondents uh, with other actors, we, for example, will ask them um, whether they interact with any, I don't understand this, okay. Uh, whether they interact with uh, different types of governmental actors. So for example, municipalities within our case study area, which is the, um, the area in uh, dark gray on the, the map of uh, Argao, uh, whether they interact with other municipalities in Argao, municipalities in Zurich, with actors more broadly at the cantonal levels or at the federal level. And when they select any of these, then uh, other questions appear. And so, for example, here they selected uh, that they interact with municipalities in our case study area. And so then we want to know more specifically with which departments at the municipal level they are interacting with. Uh, and we do the same with different sectoral actors on the right. So, for example, if they interact with different uh, land-focused actors, uh, then another question pops up with lists of different agricultural actors, forestry actors, um, et cetera. And, um, <clears throat> and so their responses, uh, so we're collect, we'll be collecting responses from hopefully many different respondents. And these responses will then feed into the social allow us to build the social network. So this is just an example, uh, a very big simplification of one respondent, let's say someone from NGO one responds. And so uh, you see that NGO one is connected to different stakeholders at local and at higher level. And then as we get more responses, we slowly build uh, the network, the social network, and then you start seeing more interactions between actors at different in different directions, and you start seeing which actors are more connected. And so then once we have the ecological network and the social network, we want to put the two together and build the social ecological network. Um, and then we're also getting some of this information from the survey. So um, this is one example of a question that we will ask. So uh, this is a map of one of the case study areas. And uh, we will ask respondents uh, whether they work in any of the municipalities in this case study area. And so they select the ones that are relevant to them. And then we ask uh, whether they work with any of these blue-green infrastructures on the right. So we, we will ask this for a whole range of different blue-green spaces. These are more related to aquatic um, elements. And so if they say yes, then they'll, uh, we'll ask them with which of the selected municipalities uh, do they work with on these various uh, blue-green infrastructures. Um, and here is another representation. So you have the social network on top and the ecological network on the bottom, and we want to integrate them. Um, and so you see the, the red nodes are the social actors, and we will try to link them to uh, the ecological nodes, so the ecological uh, infrastructures. <clears throat> then we're also interested in uh, better understanding the different barriers that respondents, um, so these different stakeholders that they face in the design and implementation and maintenance and monitoring of various types of blue-green uh, infrastructures. So that's also something that we're going to ask about in the survey. Uh, and we broadly identified five categories of barriers. So some are more related to governments and institutions, to uh, social cultural um, practices, habits, to knowledge. So for example, lack of knowledge, lack of data or knowledge sharing. Um, technical and biophysical uh, challenges. So really uh, the type of soil or the building structure to build a, a blue-green infrastructure uh, and financial barriers. 
Um, and then we want to know, so then there are more specific barriers within each of these categories. And you see some uh, examples on the top right. Uh, and the respondents can select the barriers that they experience. And then uh, we want to know with who they experience these. So we'll ask them to select uh, the stakeholders with whom they, they experience these barriers. And then we will try to match the two. Um, and so this is to basically get uh, more input into uh, different patterns of interactions that we've identified through the social ecological network. So um, add another dimension and try to explain why we see certain interactions or we don't see certain interactions. Uh, and this will also serve as uh, input, hopefully, for the uh, workshop series with Collaboratio uh, Helvetica. Exactly. So now a bit on the, the workshop series that we are planning. Basically, everything is run a bit in parallel because uh, having regular meetings and interviews with multiple stakeholders is also essential and key for us to really better understand the reality of the, the region. And uh, so what we are doing, um, we just started the first workshop, the first internal workshop together with Collaboratio Helvetica. And there it's really about, uh, so there will be three main steps. We expect to invite about 30 to 40 participants for three half days um, workshops. And there we will be using the theory of you or theory of change, which is a method uh, uh, of leadership and collective intelligence management designed to discover and implement innovate, innovative solutions. And it's um, divided in three parts. So first about shared ecosystem mapping. And here the ecosystem is a bit different from what ecologists are used as ecosystem because uh, really nodes also or important um, elements of the ecosystem are also really socially oriented or issues and problems and relationships. And then it's about deepening the systemic understanding, which is really about uh, inviting and listening to other people's needs and demands and um, developing new ideas collaboratively. So really developing collaborative solutions. Um, this is a very simplified a uh, description of what this all is actually, but we are discovering as we go. And in order to make it attractive for stakeholders, we really do interviews to understand what, what they are interested in, what would they like to do. And we also realized that the calling question, so when we invite them, the way we invite them and what we, yeah, how we phrase it is very, is very important. And uh, this is just to give you a little overview on the different people that we reached out to, but we continue to do this. These are some of the first one. They come from very different sectors. And to all of them, we asked a bit, what are your goals? Who do you work with? What are the main challenges and your needs? What would interest you in such a workshop and what would motivate, like what, what really would you like to do in such a, a workshop because we realized that these people, this is really not their priority to engage with us on this. So it needs to be useful to them. And maybe just some, a little overview. So this is, was an interview with an architect, Scott Liot. Uh, he works in several areas in Zurich and also Argau. And he was really saying that the architectural domain has really a human-centric uh, vision, but there is more and more will to, um, to look into more sustainable solution. They really want evidence-based arguments, for example, and they, he's interested also to see what are um, shared tolerances uh, in terms of collaborative work, like what can a stakeholder accept to do in order to collaborate with another, but what are really uh, aspects that they cannot um, take a compromise in. And some ideas were shared across stakeholders. Here was an interview with the Canton of Argau. They are also interested to learn more about what are shared uh, needs and demands and how people can work better together. And then they 
uh, expressed also the some challenges in terms of uh, land accessibility and uh, in terms of maintenance of blue green spaces. And for example, if we talk about this aspect of the maintenance, then it's also shared across very different actors as well that are actually in the field and that maintain this um, these spaces. So we're really trying to under, to look at commonalities across different stakeholders, but also look at what are their uh, their differences and yeah, in terms uh, of developing collaborative solutions. And this is a very interesting in part, and it really uh, involves a, a variety of people. For example, here we have uh, he's, uh, working in this field of amphibian conservation since more than 30 years, even more. <laughs> and uh, they bring very interesting insights into our work as well, because they know about the landscape from a very long time. And uh, we're reaching the end here. So just a little bit about our next steps because it's a uh, work in progress, um, but we're almost done building the survey. So we hope that in the maybe a couple of weeks or something, we will be able to, to send it out. There, there's a lot of work also involved in uh, our uh, research assistants and collaborators are also helping us with that to just collect um, the contact information of thousands of stakeholders that we're interested in, in reaching out to. So that's a lot of work, but uh, the survey is almost finished. <clears throat> we're also gonna continue doing explorative interviews that Julia was just talking about. <clears throat> and it also really helps us get a, a better understanding of the, the broader context and challenges. Uh, we're planning workshops. So uh, there will be probably three in September, October and November. Um, and we're also still working a bit on um, thinking about governance barriers and solutions uh, in the form of policy instruments. And this will likely also be integrated in the survey, but maybe also be a, a separate part of the, uh, the research to sort of <clears throat> think once you have built this social ecological network and you understand better the patterns of interactions, also having like a more qualitative understanding of what these relationships are like, where, where the challenges are between who and how potentially uh, you could address them. Um, so yeah, I think that yeah. that's it. And that's just an image from the, sorry. And thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>